Welcome to Norwegian Spitfire Foundation. This is NSF Talks. Hello and welcome to NSF Talks. It's been a while. Um, NSF Talks is a series to dive deeper than ever before into the complexity of Norwegian Speedfire Foundation, our mission and the various of people that are involved in helping us achieve our goals. And that is to acquire, restore, operate and maintain Speedfires. And welcome back, Knut. Uh, I know we spoke a little bit about this the last time uh, we uh, we had a podcast that we would perhaps do something a little bit different and uh, today we have something different uh, for uh, you guys. Um, I don't know Knut, do you want to introduce our our subject and our talk today? Yes, uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, hello everyone again. Thanks for tuning in to us. We Last time we talked, uh, we talked a bit about um, Turi Dalasian's uh, author uh, career and and how he managed to start writing books about uh, aviation and and uh, Norwegian pilots and so forth and it got us thinking hey we should have an, a special about uh, Finn Torshager and uh, using him as a representative uh, of the entire Norwegian effort in the uh, two fighter squadrons uh, sort of uh, since he uh I was so fortunate to to gather a lot of sources uh, of uh, Finn Torshage's uh, uh, life uh, and time in the in the squadrons uh, and other activities that he 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 became I think a very good example of, of sort of the Norwegian fighter pilot uh, representing all of them. Uh, and I, I think it will be very interesting to, for us to take a different uh, view on this. Usually we we have a lot of information, factual information about where they were and what they did and what the aircraft they shot down and dates and so on, uh, which is very good in, in a way of uh, accurately um, uh, writing down history. But the human aspect, I feel, is often overlooked. So the mental aspect and uh, and uh, the way of actually fighting a war uh, from the human element side, and I think that's something we can approach today. Yes, exactly. So, uh, like you said, um, we we choose uh, Finn Torshager, um because he is uh, one of many, and he he may represent them all, like. Uh, PL-258, uh, the Spitfire, may represent all the Norwegian Spitfires and the history. Um, so let's just make Finn Torshager uh, uh, a good example of what it was like to be uh, a Norwegian fighter pilot during the war. And uh, even his, his background and his upbringing and what happened to him after the war. And he is a he is a good example and uh, most importantly and this is this is very important because you, you know when you when you have a squadron uh, and you have a lot of fighter pilots and you know there's individualism involved and you know, some of these these guys you know some people liked you know certain groups and others were not that well liked um but i i do know for a fact that uh, Finn Torshager was he was very very lo- well liked among ground crew and the pilots alike. So uh, from from that aspect as well, he is a very good um, representative for 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 all of them. And he uh, let's just say that he is a very normal, common uh, young Norwegian in the 1920s and 30s, going through some very serious. Uh, times uh, in a very serious uh, part of history, so to speak. Yes, uh, and like you say, Knut, we, we we would like to focus a little bit on this 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 human factor um, because these guys were they were young and they were 
uh, they were thrown into something they had no control over. So that's yeah. what we're tr trying to at least. But we we will now talk a little bit about his uh, his history and his his background. And you, Knut, have made up some uh, some questions and you've thought this through. So um, I'll let you start and I will answer and then we will try to reflect a little bit about uh, whatever we come up with. Yes. Uh what I like is, um, well, uh, I remember back uh, when I started in the foundation, you gave me this uh, book in Norwegian, Gladiator, which I think might have been one of your very first deep endeavors into Norwegian pilots uh, during the war. Uh, and your foreword was um, very interesting because it, it sort of touched uh, the nail right on the head, and that was uh, fear. Since we usually have we talk about you know uh, uh, pilots and what they did almost in a romantic way, since we weren't there and there's no way for us to actually know how it was for them. Uh, and if they don't tell anything about it, or if they're you know quiet about it, then no one will actually know how it was. Uh, so uh, uh, to admit. The word admit, I feel, is very negatively charged, but to say that you acknowledge uh, your fear, uh, I think is very important. And I, I like that introduction since it shows that they are fighter pilots, but they're also humans. Yes, I, I, I know what you're talking about now, Nan. And, and this this story about Finn Torshager being, he, he was talking to a, a fellow colleague, a fellow fighter pilot after the war, right? And and I think it was Finn who asked this other uh, fighter pilot if he was he was afraid or if he was scared when all of this happened. And for some strange reason, and this is you know this this is like people are are, are different type of uh, beings, you know. And and I think he replies that he he wasn't you know afraid uh, this this fellow colleague of his, but Finn was uh, Finn admitted that he was. He had been scared uh, and afraid. And what kind of what kind of person in a situation of war, flying uh, Spitfire uh, thirty thousand feet over the British Channel, the English Channel, isn't afraid? So I like I suspect that that was a bit cultural of him to deny his his fear like that. But maybe he had his reasons because maybe you don't want to ch touch upon that. You don't yes. want to stir the pot, so to speak, and just just keep that those emotions away uh, but finn admitted that he was he had been scared which i feel is natural in yeah and in i think this. i think uh, the way that he allowed himself to admit to others that he was afraid is a very important opening uh to to tackle this very difficult subject since most didn't talk about it uh, as, as you know, right. I know, very few people talked about their experiences during the war. And is it a cultural thing or is it something they want to leave in the past and move on? Uh, or is it something that they don't want to, you know, admit because it's, it's difficult to them? And having someone that openly admits to it and, is share, and, um, and, and uh, wrote down, you know, his memoirs uh, and and allowed his um, thoughts to be known is very, is very, very, um, how do you say, important. Yep, yep. Uh, we, yes. we do know that some some of these these veterans who survived the war, they they did not handle it that well. And I'm sure there's a, a few thousand reasons uh, as to why some of them just didn't handle, and some handled it very, very good. Uh, you have a guy like Finn Torshager who seemed to have handled this, you know, you've, very well. Mm. Um, but but you never know. But maybe it's because he wrote these things down. And there is also a, a, a point in the book where he, when he's back in Oslo, uh, in I think it was May or June 1945, and he 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 said that he left his parents and you know their celebrations because he was back home and because he just wanted to sit by himself and think for a while. Um, so, so maybe there is something there that maybe he 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 had this way of dealing, uh, reflecting, 
uh, within himself and you know just managing to cope because we know that a lot of these guys they they coped with alcohol because they used mm. they they simply used alcohol and there is a story because I I had uh, I had a lecture once um, and uh, in uh, there, there were there were there was a guy uh, listening to me having this talk and he apparently had been present. Uh, at Gardemund just after the war, like in the 50s, maybe late 40s. And he he knew some of these guys and some of these names that I had been writing about. And he said, my God, they 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 drank. They drank so much. Uh, yes. and, and that's what he remembered from from these, you know, these veterans, because he, he wasn't a veteran himself. So, mm. so there's, there might be something there, too. Yeah, we will definitely come uh to to touch that subject again later i have some questions about you know coping making coping mechanisms and and different ways uh people react and um, respond to to being uh yeah to to going through that kind of a life uh so it's again a, a part of a part of uh, history that is often either overlooked or not given too much attention uh we can uh i my i have also a question about the um his immediately after uh, uh, i mean if, uh, if you know finn torsage was part of the the jager wing in or the fighter wing in, in norway and fought uh, on, on uh, 9th of april during invasion uh and like many of his colleagues and himself he eventually managed to f- flee the country and join the training camp in little norway in Tur- outside toronto in canada uh and he became an instructor as he was experienced already and his approach to to training uh new uh students or cadets um is i think very interesting since you you you, you might think that you know someone who's experienced uh, might be quite authoritarian or or you know there's only one way to do it but uh if i understood it correctly he he had a very calm and clear approach since he knew that i was you know i was uh just a few years ago i was just as unsure of myself and nervous in the airplane and you have to learn uh on your own you can't you can't be forced to 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 be to be better and you know reprimanding or yelling at someone won't improve you at all so his his way of uh, instructing it's probably helped many many pilots uh, to survive the war yes uh, you bring up a very good point because um, whenever you read some of these these books uh, or these memoirs uh, you, you sort of and, and back in those days you sort of run into this authoritarian type of people that sort of just smack your fingers and tell you what to do and uh, and, and stuff like that but from what I could gather and understand, um, Finn, he had, without knowing this, that he, he mm. actually had a very modern and correct way of, of teaching. Uh, he was very calm. He was, uh, he was uh, perhaps a quiet kind of guy. It's, it's something to do with the personality as well. Because Finn Tushagir, he, um, he wasn't edgy in any way. He was quite mild. He, he was friends with everyone. And and so he just he just used his personality uh, to be an instructor because no one taught him to be an instructor. It's just something he you know he, he just did based on his senses and his personal personality. Uh, yes. And I think and and I think he had Marius Eriksson as uh, an instructor. And uh, Marius Eriksson was he you know he became one of the you know top top. You know, fighter pilots that we had, like a massive talent. Yeah, and uh, after the war, he he is a celebrity. So he yes. became like the personification of the Norwegian, and he was even, you know, he was in that famous propaganda image of the fighting Norwegian. Uh, so yes, so it's interesting that personality has a huge impact on uh, on on the future of pilots, and it, it also brings me back a bit to my own flying. Uh, as I was a student, you know, and, and my instructors, they impact me a lot, very much the way you think. And, and um, if you have a, a poor instructor, it will, it will can severely hamper you. So I'm very fortunate. I've had a lot of good instructors and 
it it remind if, if it's correct as Finn as you said that Finn had this calm approach and clear approach and concise approach to things and didn't you know uh, were, didn't yell uh, too much or wasn't authoritarian then it's very very much in time in tune with today's view of things and how to teach and and in, it doesn't doesn't need to just be instructors but you know teaching as a teacher today in school you know so yeah so so apparently he was way ahead of his time. Uh, mm. by how he uh, that he was an instructor at, at Little Norway and you know in, in hindsight maybe they should have kept him there as an instructor because I think he did a w- really good job but um, they were short of pilots and they wanted to form these this squadrons um, and so after his, his, his short so much short tenure at you yeah. know in Canada and, and he yeah. so he became part of the you know the first um, the first fighter wing or the first batch yes. of pilots go. He he was part of the first batch of pilots, and uh, again, it's it's uh, interesting how things um, developed there. Since Norwegians at that point, we were allies, yes, but we hadn't proven ourselves. We were more, you could say, we were untested. So uh, how we were able to integrate into the British system, I think, is again they, that's a bit of a diversion then or a digression, but. But uh, we had to prove ourselves to the British that we were fighting fit and capable. Uh, so why were we, you know, why were we set up straight up to Skebri in Orkneys? You know, there, there must be a reason for that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there was some kind of reason for it. Um, I think there was somewhat of a war going, you know, on, but, you know, within the RAF and F- Fighter Command and the Norwegian government and the Norwegian military forces and, you know, and, and how we were supposed to be in usage, because, like you said, we we weren't really tried and tested, because the only uh, you know fighting experience that we had in uh, in in uh, during World War Two, you know, up until that point was 9th of April 1980. No, I'm sorry, 9th of April 1940, um, and some flying up north, which I can't really you know say were any fighting. It was more like a reconnaissance type of thing, uh, but. You know, Finn Torshagi, he was also a part of, of that short uh, struggle in the air uh, during uh, 9th, of, 9th of April. Yes. Uh, because uh, he was the first that actually opened fire, uh, just so we touch upon that point as well. Yeah. No, it's... Um, it's um, I, 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 um, uh, I can feel the frustration of the, of the air crew and... And the pilots and and everyone in Orkney since they they now been one year uh, so it's autumn of 1941 they they're finally you know trained and ready and able and they're keen to make a difference and then they're stationed up there in the Orkneys where they might see nothing but hailstorm and nothing it's just nothing there uh, so that must be hugely depressive uh, depressing on their on their uh, morale and and there were a few who were lost their lives in you know these careless acts. Uh, uh, some drowned, and I think someone also had some crashes or air accidents. You know, they 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 were they were probably who knows burning out or just being restless of being up there. Yeah, it's it's true. Um, they they had a few losses up there as well, um, and I think that some of them even uh, admitted to other. Uh, Colleagues in the uh, in the in the squadron that they they were they were depressed. I'm not sure if they used that that type yeah. of word back then, but that they 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 felt that they they left uh, maybe they they left a good position within the you know the resistance back home or uh, something like that, and then they ended up in a godforsaken place in Skabre in in Scotland, yeah. where you only had a reconnaissance German uh, aircraft going you know across the sky at 4 a.m. in the morning, and you could never reach it. So what what was the the point and then it was cold and it was uh, you had little spare parts and but but this is also uh, at the point where Finn Tushager leaves 331 squadron and moves on to uh, the newly formed 332 squadron at Catterick which was uh, further down south because they uh, they they sort of had no place for him and they needed experience in 332 because it was um, it was so brand new so he moved on from from that horrible situation at Scabre and going down to Catrick, which I uh, think was uh, a lucky shot for him uh, at that point. 
Absolutely. Uh, just imagining being sort of stuck up there at Skibri and now you finally are coming down south. You're not fully south yet, but you are closing on your intended area. So you know that, okay, this is getting serious now. We are getting into the fight and uh, slowly learning. And, 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 and for the first time, perhaps for the very first time, uh, the pilots and Fintushager are starting to feel the war on their skin. You know, they are in combat, or they are, they are hearing, they, uh, they, um, they, they um, are, uh, you know, uh, their colleagues or his colleagues are have been in battle or wounded or there's been damage. So, you know, the realities of war are starting to to sink in. And uh, exactly. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so and, and this time that Finn was, uh, he was a flight commander um, uh, when they were based at uh, at Catrick. So, so this was this was like a, a valuable time because you, like you say, they're they're not like in the middle of everything, uh, but they're they're close enough to get a sense of uh, what might happen later on if they are you know have to move somewhere else. Uh, yeah. So, so so Finn and. Uh, and I think it was Vilal Mor who was squadron leader, and I think they uh, yes. they managed to uh, do some proper training uh, while being an active uh, squadron at that time. Yeah, and uh, it brings up a good point. Is um, you know, unlike Battle of Britain, which is such a desperate fight, and it's you know, I I, I cannot go into detail and be worthy of all the of all the um, stories from that battle but it's different now in the battle of britain you know there was a scramble to survive uh, not much time for training and uh, you know incredibly brave pilots who had terribly low flying hours but now the war is changing a bit so so the norwegians uh, who were then able to train in canada and then uh, a stint in Skibri, and now also being able to prepare for the real battle in Catterick, they are more prepared and I think that's one of the prime reasons that eventually the Norwegian squadrons became very effective is that they had a very thorough training and they could slowly build up their experience, not being thrown straight into the meat grinder, you know, uh, like on the Eastern Front, for example, where you there was, you know, you had you you had very much a uh, very very low amount of training. Exactly, and uh, and. Uh... You know, it's debated whether or not uh, and Norway should have, you know, given away their pilots during 1940. And I know the pilots wanted to, uh, but these things are they're complicated and there is uh, nuances. Um, they, they, we, we kept our experienced pilot like Finn Torshager, Wilhelm Maud, uh, and a few others, um, and they gained experience and they created this sort of foundation for these two squadrons. Uh, to operate and uh, let's just say that if you had thrown Finn Torshager into the Battle of Britain in 1940, mm. he, he may not ever have survived that. Um, so, so there's there's nuances uh, and and it's a complex situation. Uh, but we, like you say, we did manage to build that you know uh, foundation and the, the the British were you know checking us out uh, at Skirbray and at Catrick, and that's why we were sent to to North Weald. Uh, mm. In 1942, uh, and then uh, Finn and 332 Squadron uh, were united, reunited, basically, uh, based on Little Norway, at least, um, with their sister squadron, 331 Squadron. Yeah, and I remember, uh, I remember uh, in the interview that Willem Moore he said it, but I'm sure Finn said it would have said it himself too that they were quite envious of 331 going down to Northfield first. <laughs> oh, of course. Of course, they weren't they weren't friends all the time. These guys, they were they were like 19 year olds, 20 year olds, 23 year olds. They argued and they fought and they drank. Yeah. Um, so so at that point, when these 331 squadron guys were coming in to land at Catrick and and they told these boys from 332 that they were going down south, they weren't you know they were they were envious, they were jealous. Yeah. They didn't like it. They were keen. They were yeah. keen to go somewhere, and now they felt they were stuck. And that and that. You know, envy and that rivalry, you know, pushed each other to be better. That we're we're gonna be better than three three one. That's for sure. And they they kept uh, this rivalry going. And in the end, they both 
became more effective that way since they were in the same wing and not the, none none of them was going to be any worse than the other. Right, so, right. So right. A, a very very interesting um, camaraderie and sort of um, yeah, pushing each other. And um, the, I think that as for Finn personally, I think he remember that first uh, sortie from North Weald with the Wing Commander Scott Molden quite well. Mm. And, and and you know this story because it's it's been told uh, a lot of times where we, we uh, have we have even said it in our flight simulator yes yes session. yes <laughs> we have so it, it's sort of like a, a legendary thing now when but we, we, we can do it anyway and because they're flying uh, towards France or something and uh, the flag starts to be quite intense and then there is one uh, very scared Norwegian uh, pilot on the radio saying it's it's getting very close. So Scott Mullen says, don't touch it. Uh, but, you know, if you look behind that, you know, that funny remark from Scott Mullen, you can tell that these guys were nervous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just having uh, a very experienced, still, how young was Scott Mullen? Was he 23 or something? I think it was uh, 22. 22. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wing commander. Uh, and he is the confidence of gods, you know, to the rest. And being so... Very, very calm and firm, just saying, yes, I see them too. Don't touch it. You know, right. it brings confidence to everyone who's very on edge already. Yes. But imagine that he he was, you know, he was the he was basically, you know, their their uh, their uh, <laughs> their uh, their god uh, in 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 the sense of being only 22 years old, but still so much more knowledgeable and and skillful and having gone through the war as well so it's right. crazy to think that all of these young boys were less than 25 26 years old most of them yes they they were and when they they came down to to north wheel uh because these were these were rough guys some of them like you have like types like finn tushager he had a good upbringing good education uh didn't suffer during the 30s and he was from oslo but then you have this you know this rough group of sailors you know because they mm. were just just happened to be uh, you know, overseas when the war broke out, and then they just uh, volunteered for the for whatever, and they ended up in the air force. Uh, and these guys were rough. Um, so when they came down to to Epping and North Weald, they went completely uh, haywire. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, yeah. uh, most most of these guys did. Uh, they they were banned from the pubs because they created mayhem. And the, how how was it, since that's again something you hear very little of is. Okay, how was everyday life with Norwegians? And that is a huge clash. You have one, as you said. How was it? How was the daily daily life with uh, with the sailors and the rough part? You, you know, no no disrespect to it, but it's a different culture. Uh, how was and the even culture even crash? more back then, even way more back then, when when you had these 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 guys from like the rough sides of Oslo or or the countryside, and then you you sort of, sort of mix with this. They weren't yeah. academics, you know, because because Finn he 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 was never an academic type of of person. He had a good he, upbringing, but he wasn't yes. an academic person. No, he exactly. wasn't, and he barely got into uh, flying because his uh, grades were too low. Uh, yeah. But they managed to bring him in anyway, which was it just tells you that uh, you know academia is not um, always a judge good you know good judge yeah. on what you're gonna do. Uh, in the air, he never had an accident in the air. Yeah. He he flew through uh, several years uh, with the fighter squadrons, and he, he flew on the Stockholm run, and he n- he never had any accidents. But mm. uh, you know, but he never he never spoke specifically about what he did. Uh, I spoke to Villa Mora a little bit about it, and he didn't like specify that he did this and that. But there re- there are hints in uh, the Spitfire Saga books by Carl Gunfeld that. Like there were some people worse than others, and there were some mm-hmm. piles too that were worse, uh, worse than others, especially when it came to to drinking. Uh, yeah. But we we don't really know the whole story. But I know they were banned from the pubs, uh, and and you know they couldn't go out because they had gone completely bananas. Uh, yeah. But but things did settle down uh, culturally, and when they you know sort of got through that first phase, uh, um, things you know settled down a little bit. And and here's the here's a part. Uh, you know, during the summer of uh, 1942, 332 Squadron didn't do that well because they lost they lost a considerable amount of pilots. 
And uh, Marius Eriksson, he later wrote that, you know, he was of the opinion that the squadron should have been put on a rest period because mm. of all these losses, but they 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 didn't. Uh, but yeah. and, and and Finn was a part of um, the squadron back then, and he he doesn't he, he didn't mention a lot of of people in his memoirs when he wrote them, but he he did mention at least one name, maybe there were two, because we have two examples of things going horribly wrong yes. during the summer of 1942. Yes, uh, we'll bring them up very soon. It just thought, made me think, why do you think he didn't mention specific names in his memoirs? Is it one way of his? Is it one way for him to process it in his own way? Good question. Um, I think nothing to do. I'm not gonna, you know, put a, you know, a shadow over his his uh, legendary position as a fighter pilot. But he, like Wilhelm Moore said, Finn wasn't like the best at writing stuff. So mm. I just think it's probably something to do with him uh, not finding the correct words to 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 to, to uh, refer to certain individuals, which he should have, because it's it's the people involved which makes the story. Yes, uh, and, and a lot of them just skip that part and talk of the squadron as a whole. But they they should have, because personally, I the the my best experiences, you know, writing the book was when I managed to get people to to characterize him or others, like <laughs> yes. when because I had a uh, a, a mechanic uh, on he was on Facebook then he, he he's passed now but he but he sent me a message and he said um, besides of Wilhelm Moore and Finn, um, uh, I'm sorry, Wilhelm Moore and Marius Eriksson, uh, there were no one better liked than Finn Torshager in the squadron, which was my point. It's and very, then, it's a very interesting point then, since someone that was so much liked by everyone, and yet, you know, being too humble or for whatever reason, did not write enough about his experiences with other people. It's very interesting. Uh, it's just. It's difficult to, to know why, but it was a, it was during a war, and and then to write something in hindsight, you know, uh, is is um, you know is both advantage and disadvantage. <laughs> it, it is, and and most of these Norway, there were there's some British pilots who are brutally honest honest with what they're doing and what they wrote, um, but when it comes to these Norwegian pilots, they were. Maybe age affected their ability to, you know, tell it like it is, or maybe it's the culture. Like, because when I was growing up, I, I didn't really look upon that generation as something uh, like my own generation. But then yeah. I, I, I did read some British uh, mem- memoirs from a, some certain fighter pilots, and I saw, okay, because you were just like us you, you there is absolutely no difference it's just that when you got 65 years old you covered certain parts of it up because it's not like accepted to 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 talk either about emotions or about the drinking or about you know how how rough it was and that, and that is uh, where the british society which accepts and encourages and uh, honors their veterans much more than norway that's where they come much more ahead so we we know that uh, as you just said that the the, the British pilots and uh, were just like us in terms of you know or or, or the Norwegian pilots uh, sorry uh, were just like the British in a way that we're all human and we we're, we're going through the same challenges uh, and then uh, when Germany started to uh, be rebuilt and uh, start to reconcile with its past and its and its uh, veterans they too wrote uh, books and uh, just uh, with the same emotions as uh, the rest uh, but the problem in Norway as we are, as we are usually come to uh, you know hint about uh, here and there in these podcasts is there's a lack of recognition uh, and honoring our, the stories of our veterans so probably they just stayed quiet they didn't write it because there wasn't a culture for it yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that because it, when you're when no one really wants you to talk, you do not talk. Uh, yeah. You just you just keep quiet because they no one is rec- you know recognizes your uh, your story and they don't want to. And, and so I think you're right about that part. So just let's go back to the summer of '42 because 
Yes. Uh, it wasn't going that well. No, the, uh, um, the, our, our Norwegian squadrons are still rather fresh, uh, keen, but we are still, or the, the, the squadrons are still rather inexperienced. And in the middle of that, they are now in 11th group at North Weald, and they are fighting, you know, the, 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 the real war down there. And here they're doing bomber escort missions into France and uh, low countries. Uh, and they meet the Focke Wolf 190 that everyone who follows uh, the Second World War you knows it's it's the legend and the butcher bird that many calls it uh, for a good reason. And it really was a problem, a huge problem. It was a huge worry. How are we going to deal with this new menace, the Focke Wolf menace? We have aircraft that aren't capable or to 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 outperform it in most areas. And perhaps we are also, you know, not being too careful. Uh, so we have an event. We have it's. It was very, very dark time for the Norwegian squadrons and lo- lo- large losses. Yes, large losses. And at one, I think one sort, they lost even four pilots. I think two were killed and two were taken prisoner. And then, you know, having flown out on a sortie and then you come back for short. That's that's a lot. Mm. But then you also have. Uh, a story like Arivo Oz, who turned back because of engine trouble, um, uh, and he was supposed to cover uh, the, the Spitfire with the engine trouble. Yeah, um, it's, and, it's, and then uh, he gets shot down uh, because of that. It's um, reading reading it. Uh, it reminded me of the Swiss cheese effect, uh, or uh, that I went through pilot training. So you have all of these all of these events coming together and culminating into a disaster and it all started just with uh two air uh, two uh, the the 332 squadron was the rear guard of the bomber formation going to uh Heisbuk, uh and they were guarding the rear and the other the 331 and the other squadrons in the wing they were at the front uh, and right off from straight from the battle almost uh, just passing the english coast to the channel two of the aircraft uh, had to return because they had engine problems. So you already lost two two fighters from the formation. And we haven't even started the the, the, the sortie yet, sort of. Uh, and then halfway over the channel, deep into a uh, uh, dangerous area, uh, Marius Eriksson gets also engine trouble and he starts to lag behind the formation. And just imagining being alone with engine trouble over the channel or, or over France uh, you're all alone and you're just you're just a prime target to be bounced from behind yeah and, uh, Marius Eriksson is 18 years old he's scared shitless uh, yeah. at that point yes so out of us which was his uh, number one so Marius Eriksson was his wingman uh, he turns around to escort Marius back to England and in that moment as he is turning away from the bomber formation, leaving the 332 there, uh, which Finn is part of. They're, fl- they're flying on, and Arvos is turning around to to join Marius and take him home. Uh, there's a swarm of focke wolves who bounce from the sky over the, from the sun and attack them, and they are absolutely, you know, devastated. Marius managed to escape somehow. I can't understand how he was able to escape, but he survived. And uh, the last thing he saw was uh, was, uh, going down in smoke, pouring out of his engine and never saw him again. Didn't see a parachute, didn't see what happened. He just had he was fighting four or five other focke wolves. So, yeah, he had he was busy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and then then you also have the uh, the August situation where because uh, this is one of the names that Finn talks about in his memoirs, and that is uh, Henning Leifset from um, northern Norway. Um, he was part of 331, uh, and I didn't really understand why Henning was so important to Finn, but I understood when I saw his photo, uh, they had been uh, students at uh, Kjellir uh, before the war. So they, they were educated on the same uh, in the same year, and that's why they were friends. Uh, and during this sortie over the coast of France, um, that's a month later, I think. Um, and I, I believe that Henning asks Finn specifically before they fly out that he 
uh, if he could take you know a pro- you know k- keep an eye out uh, for him because he uh, Henning is flying lower with his squadron and Finn is higher with with 332. Uh, but then they get tangled up with some focke wolves, uh, and naturally, of course, Finn loses sight of of Henning Leifset. Uh, and the next thing uh, they see and they know is uh, a Spitfire that burns uh, on the beach. Uh, I think it's at Dieppe, uh, and that is Henning Leifset. Mm, yes. And and it's because of the you know the the talk they had before the sortie. That's what makes uh, an impact on. On, on Finn's mentality, is that uh, he was told or asked to keep an eye out, and it wasn't his fault by no means, but but he's been told to keep an eye out, and he can't. Uh, and the next thing he know, uh, knows, his friend is dead. Um, and and I'm I'm pretty sure that that made an impact without him saying anything in the memoirs, uh, because he mentions his name and he mentions that situation exactly. Uh, you also have. We can do that one too, uh, which it was in in February of 1943, which he also mentions by name and by uh, by incident. Yeah, it's you might just imagine being yourself. You lost a, a dear friend, and you 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 blame yourself for it. How are you gonna? I, yeah. How are we gonna go through that? Hmm. This is just me speculating, but I am pretty sure that he uh, he had to tackle uh, his own mind. Uh, at that point, uh, for some time ahead, yeah, uh, yeah, and and maybe for uh, maybe until the day that he passed away, um, because yeah. that's what something he specifically mentioned uh, during his memoirs. Um, it might be a, it, it might be like again speculating, but it might be a, a point, you know, as you said that where where he specifically mentions names and and events, that surely must mean that it is important to him. Yes, I, I, I would say so. So, um, but you know, taking his just just mentioning that his career is progressing because others, you know, they they uh, they they get killed or they get uh, transferred and so on. Uh, so by I think it's January or February 1943, uh, and he takes charge of the squadron uh, from Wilhelm Moorhen because he goes on a on the rest period. So suddenly this this calm and and mild. Uh, kind character from from uh, Oslo is in charge of uh, a deadly fighter squadron, uh, mm. and one of their you know this uh, fighter squadron's aim is to shoot down aircraft, and you know uh, you know there's a person within that aircraft, and and suddenly this this kind gentleman is is in charge of this uh, you know the, this uh, this beast. Was uh, there a cult crash in the are in the in the in, in the top brass? About the the way uh, you know he led the squadron, or that there were uh, certain kinds of personalities leading the squadron, you know, like like Finn Tushager or Kai Birkstead or Rolf Anneberg and so on. I, I think that's some of these these some of these guys uh, were more keen than others. I'm not sure if Finn Tushager falls into that category of being you know the most keen, uh, you know, taking taking the most risks. Because you know there there are certain uh, people who took risks and got away with it, especially like Helner Grundspang or or Marius Eriksson, who he, he took a lot of risks. Uh, even Rolf Arne Berg took risks. Uh, I don't think Finn Tushager took that you know those risks, not as I understand him. Uh, but he had the experience. Uh, I think he and Wilhelm Moore they were good friends and they maybe they were you know a bit of the same type. Uh, but like you had, you know, we had a a character like Martin Gran, you know, super eyesight, uh, extremely keen, a good tactician, and I, I think a squadron like 331, you know, they they really did well because of these, you know, these characters. And even though 332 had the same, uh, they weren't that edgy uh, as 331. Um, but maybe that's what saved his life in the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh... We, we will never know, but uh, the different personalities that led the squadrons uh, uh, directed uh, their their the way things happened. Uh, and what it, it's it will be uh, it will be wrong to debate uh, if one way is better than the other. But certainly, I think his careful w- approach 
and his methodical approach to things uh, saved many lives and his own life. Yes, I would say so, because what if you had given this squadron to a uh, an, an more inexperienced type of fighter pilot, uh, you know, brilliant, you know, uh, pilot in all sense, but maybe someone who took more risks and maybe would get more losses because yes. you, you never know with these things. And I know there there's some hints in the uh, in the Spitfire Saga books that Finn Tushager, he, he was like. Uh, like this, he was he, he didn't perhaps didn't like conflict that much. He he, he was a kind guy. He, he wasn't necessarily a brutal fighter pilot, you know, with you know a killer instinct and, and anything like that. So perhaps that's also why he never came back to 332 Squadron after his uh, spell as a squadron leader, but rather went on to something else. I don't know. Mm. Uh, these things, you know, people are different. Um, I don't know. That, that's my that's my speculation. Yeah. Well, uh, a very a very uh, interesting subject that we only can we only can wonder uh, the the uh, what we do know a bit more about though is is um, how they coped with being a fighter pilot. I um, mm-hmm. I uh, remember from um, um, I wasn't there personally, but I. Uh, re- I, there, there, had, there was a video of um, of Ville Moore, uh, in t- 2014, I think it was, when Norwegian Spitfire Foundation represented uh, the Norwegian pilots uh, and their effort and ground crew, uh, together with uh, Carter Gunfeldt uh, and Spitfire Saga. And Ville Moore, in that uh, presentation, he said, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that it was important to have a moment with your own thoughts as you were walking to the airplane after the brief. Uh, so taking a moment on your own in the cockpit, preparing yourself for what is to come. And the ground crew knew then not to speak. Uh, so you're just imagining you are you have had your brief and you know what you're going to do. And there you have to transition from your normal routines on on the base uh, maybe you had a drink in the pub the day before and now you had to transition into a fighter pilot and you don't know if you're going to be alive the next hour uh, that transition i think is extremely uh important to recognize since it's probably what's made the air war for all air crew during the second world war uh but i'm thinking particularly here now for all the ones who served in the uk and so raf and and uh and and usaf and and our norwegian squadrons that this transition from living in the uk and then not knowing if you will survive at the next hour when you when you're in battle that transition i think is uh what makes the second world war for air crew stand out from any other war yeah so you're not you're not totally alive and you're not totally dead you're somewhere stuck somewhere in between and i yeah. think you also said something uh, about those you know about that and and i think that you you, you mentioned the word think and uh, maybe that's why fin tushagi also coped because he had the ability to think yeah yeah hmm. and and handle uh, whatever came his way of thoughts after the war, and that he handled that in a, uh, a way that was perhaps uh, not as common. Um, but I think uh, they they handled it, you know, so differently even during the war and after the war. Oh yeah, uh, it's um, it's to it's it's it. What is certain though is that even if we don't know details, we know that. They they had to handle this throughout their war their life. Uh, if they were fortunate enough to survive the entire war, it, it never leaves you. I'm pretty sure that those those memories they, it was perhaps the best of their the the best and the worst uh, all in one. Yes, uh, I would say so. And you know, with with Finn's uh, Finn being a squadron leader, there was also this. Um, this because he was in charge so he 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 you know he, he they ca- counted on him to do the right things and to lead the squadron in a certain way and no wonder that uh when um Vatne, uh, the one who he jumped out because he had engine trouble in february over the channel so he jumped out 
uh, they circled him, uh, but then he they could see that he drowned. And um, uh, this is also something Finn mentioned specifically in his uh, his memoirs, because I'm sure that he felt a bit of uh, responsibility just for that. And it's not his fault that the engine goes away, and, and there's really no one's fault. But he he's in charge of the squadron, and he's in charge of these guys and these young guys, and he w- this this Vatna pilot uh, he was he was completely new to the game, and then uh, he just ended up drowned in the channel without being able to do basically anything, uh, and and so that that's something that I, I think made some impact on him. Uh, and now we're into 1943. Yeah, uh, I uh, I would like to add um, something that we must not uh, forget, and that is uh, the ground crew. And Finn had a very, I think Finn and Willem both, as uh, uh, Willem or Finn and Willem or both had a very good uh, uh, attitude to 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 uh, how to. Um, to uh, to include the ground crew since you have to include them uh, you have to talk to them and you have to make sure that that uh, they are recognized for their work since if they didn't there will be no spitfires at all in the air right and, and uh, his daughter said uh, I spoke to uh, Ellen his daughter and she said that Finn, Finn was friends with everybody and that meant also the ground crew uh, and that's why you know, he was so well liked, and that's probably also why he was such a, as you say, as a liked liked person. And and being such a calm person, he was happy to chat with the ground crew after a sortie, not going straight over to the intelligence report and then straight to the pub or whatever, you know. But he 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 was considerate, and even if he if that. That does not limit just to being considerate of his pilots and his formation and his flight, uh, but certainly his ground crew as well. Since in the end, they they are what keeps everything going, and they worry about their pilots and their machine just as much as <laughs> Finn himself, I'm sure. Yes, I, I would say so. So, and but you know, by by spring of 1943, they're really starting to get you know to tackle this head on and they they're starting to uh create some results that are you know very very good in the yeah in the context of the war yeah uh in uh, starting uh this is more later in like like july and june but right at the spring time of 1943 this is where you know the allied effort to it against Luftwaffe really starts to 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 launch. Their the objective is to destroy the Luftwaffe so that an invasion can be possible. So it's so it's you're, we're, we are reversing the Battle of Britain now. We're we are we are trying uh, the the Allied air forces are, are are purposefully trying to lure the Luftwaffe up so they can destroy it. Uh, and this is 1943, spring and summer 1943. It's the most intense period of the entire war on the on the Channel front. Yeah, exactly. And it's by July that he's given orders uh, to leave for his rest period. So uh, that's when Finn uh, leaves 3-3 two squadron, and uh, he he will not return because he's going back to Canada. And here's you know. When you read his, his memoirs, you know, he, he's, he writes maybe like a paragraph or so about something like a huge dogfight with a Focke Wolf 190. And then he writes, the, you know, the same amount of, of uh, sentences about his tooth because he had a toothache. <laughs> <laughs> Probably while fighting the Focke Wolf. <laughs> so now they, uh, he, they, um, there's a dentist on uh, board the ship that takes him to, uh, to Canada. Uh, and so uh, the dentist just just pulls that thing out. But My he God, spends a yes. lot of time talking, uh, you know, writing down what happened to his tooth. <laughs> but what I I mean, oh toothache. Mm, I who wouldn't who wouldn't moan about toothache? No, a it, toothache or a Focke Wolf 190. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> both of them takes all your attention. That's for sure. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you know during you know during the rest. Uh, the rest period, you know, some served as instructors and some as, you know, ferry command pilots. And, you know, we have, uh, we should do 
do a talk on Leif Lundstedt too, and he was a test pilot. Uh, but but Finn was he he was a part of a ferry command uh, before he is uh, told to uh, given orders to go to uh, to go to uh, Sto- uh, Scotland uh, to join the Stockholm's route. And um, I'm not sure how, are we going will we have some time to talk about his Stockholm route. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting to, since we talked about it just a bit earlier, is that his transition from a, an active fighter pilot to a different f- kind of flying. So he, after his rest period, he did not return to fighter frontline duty. And yes, was that intentional? Was that something that the brass wanted or was that something that he wanted? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I... And I don't know. I, I know that some really wanted to return to 331, like Sven Heglund. Um, and he wanted to be a squadron leader. But then, you know, you had Martin Gran and it didn't really work out. So he went to 85 squadron. I, I don't know if it was intentional or if, it's, if, if it was something that Finn himself wanted to. Because the, the choice or the order of, of fly that civilian route to, to Stockholm was, you know, different. Still dangerous, very dangerous. You know, flying you know unarmed in a load star to to uh, to Sweden, that is yeah. that is something else. And I, but I honestly have to say that the Stockholm route is not my um, subject. I'm not that you know knowledgeable on that you know that flying. I, I know what Finn did, but I know I know stories where he flew over his parents' home in 1944. Um, but I, I'm not. I, I haven't even read the book. Sad to say, uh, because there is a book about the Stockholm route, and I haven't even read it. Yes, it's uh, it's it's again a very little known uh, uh, story. It was important, but it's again it's you have to really be interested in this subject to find it. And when you find it, it's it's uh, you you can <laughs> you can uh, you can always find something uh, some incredible stories. And it it uh, it also, if I remember correctly, did didn't also Finn uh, do ferry command over Greenland, so from yes. the U.S. and oh uh, yeah, and that is that and the Stockholm route. It's it's different, very different, both of them, but they both are extremely dangerous, uh, and it's just a different kind of risk. So again, talking about risk here. Yeah, uh, Finn, which I would consider being a methodical and careful person, who uh, careful in all the best meanings of the word, that he doesn't rush into danger. So uh, it was maybe a different kind of a challenge for him uh, that he wanted maybe just do something else. So do something else. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why, why not? Um, and you also, you know, needed experience pilots doing that type of flying oh, absolutely yeah, yeah to you know to navigate in in poor weather and try to dodge uh, messerschmitt 110s you know lurking in the shadows uh, in the darkness and you know trying to you know you know get your your passengers and you know uh, your mm. baggage and all of that to to stockholm which uh, uh, but um he also survived that and i here's like a side story to the because um, he apparently flew, uh, I think it was like Christmas presents or some sort of Christmas cargo to the to the 331 and 332 squadron when they were based in France. Mm, or, yeah. And and Wilhelm didn't even know because I, I told him that you know he mentioned that he flew a Lodestar and uh, Wilhelm Moore he he didn't oh, yeah. even know. No, he, so he, he was like question, yeah, yeah he was questioning if that's true or not. He's like I don't know but he wrote it so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. Uh, he he was he was too late to deliver beer on in the Spitfire. He did. So yeah, he, he didn't do that. And yeah. in the in his memoirs, he he spent a uh, considerable time writing about those moments when he came back home. Uh, you know, his family and uh, uh, whatever what hotel he uh, he stayed at, and you know the first talk because I I did mention that he. He stayed almost the entire night at his parents, and then he left in the early morning to go and, and think a little bit. Uh, yeah, that um, that uh, how you say that re- reunification. It's uh, you know words can't describe uh, probably how important that was to him. 
No, that that was you know five you know five intense years from the first person to fire upon German forces in the air in in Norway during 1940, uh, being involved in that dogfight, being you know escaping Norway, going through Sweden and Russia, and uh, you know all the way to the other side of the the globe to and the structure. And he didn't, did he tell his parents that he left or did he leave in the night without telling anyone? Oh, good question. Did he tell? I'm not sure if he openly said anything about it, but I, I do think that they they understood it somehow. Yeah. Uh, you just have to read the book again just to find out. Is that, uh, again, uh, just just that as we as we have approached before, uh, the way the PL258 represents all of the Norwegian effort abroad uh, of the air forces, it the, the the decision the very first decision begins with deciding to make a difference and flee that's that's uh you know you can say you can talk and you can talk and talk and talk but you have to make a decision i'm going to escape and i'm going yeah. to make a difference yes and and then you have these guys who felt an obligation to do it because they were trained and they were educated and i i i, I I suspect that some of them, they weren't that keen on going. Uh, mm. But then you have these people who are extremely keen because they want to make a difference and they want to be fire, a fighter pilot or they want to go yeah. somewhere. And I think with Finn, he, he, uh, it, it was both. He, he was educated and he wanted, wanted to go because he, he wanted to use his experience and his education um, to, to fight the Germans. That was and his I'm, obligation. And I'm sure a, a huge contributor to that feeling or, or that in, interest in making difference is that they, they you know, the 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 the, the attack on, on their country uh, in on Norway on the 9th of April. It was so overwhelming. They weren't able to make any, you know, any uh, useful difference, you could say. You know, was it worth it? They, they wanted revenge in the way of making, a, you know, uh, taking the fight back. And making sure that they could make a difference again, since that was a, it was a hopeless situation, absolutely hopeless for them. Yeah, and maybe you had family that you had to take care of, and you couldn't go. Uh, maybe you have, you know, you were too old or you were too young, you know, and maybe you didn't have any money to escape, because you know, you know, trying to escape through Sweden, and you you need a bit of luck to do that. Uh, and if you you you. If you uh, waited a while, it would be harder to escape because it was, you know, maybe, you know, 40, maybe the year I turned to 1942 or something. And, you know, it, it's so there was a, a lot of factors involved in, in order to make it all the way to a, to a Spitfire yeah. squad for these guys. How, how, uh, how was the end of the war coming to Finn since everyone knew that the war was going to end? But how... How was his approach to it? Since, as we know, even if the war is coming to an end, there will still be many who will lose their lives. And there were so many, so many uh, pilots in the Norwegian squadrons who lost their lives in just the last half year of the war, from January to May. Incredible and ter- tragic. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure he he knew about these losses. Uh, you know, but you know, going back to his memoirs, he's just writing. Finally, the war was over, and it was strange uh, to put it mildly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then mm-hmm. he was given orders to fly to Gardermoen with a bunch of high-ranking officers. So it's yeah. like very professional. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, very, you know, almost British, like you know, like you know, whatever went through his mind. Because um, I remembered I had to like jazz that up a little bit in, you know, <laughs> uh, in his uh, in the book because he, okay, war is over. Uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh... It's 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 just uh, it's just incredible, isn't it? How things change since you you've been fighting the whole war and and maybe and then and then it's over. Well, how, maybe it was just lack of words to find. Maybe he felt that whatever he had to say wasn't uh, you know uh, wasn't good enough, since the, the uh, he was writing this after the war. Mm-hmm. So how can he celebrate that? Oh yes, I'm alive and I've I've done my bit and I'm coming home. Uh, it's again coming back to that feeling that um, they weren't respected enough or rec- recognized for what they did. So why should he write the, how how fortunate he is that he survived and so on? 
exactly. Um, There's probably a bit of uh, guilt in in that. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. And he, um, even if he mentions just a few, I am quite sure that he kn- he knew a lot uh, of them. Uh, some close and some not so close, but I'm sure he knew all the names. Mm. And several of them never came back. Because, yeah. you know, I've, I've never seen the names Leif Lundsten and Finn Torshager in the same sentence, but I am positive that they knew each other, like most of them did. For example. Do you think they ever uh, crossed paths uh, while Leif was a uh, test pilot and uh, Finn was a ferry pilot? Maybe, maybe in Canada. Uh, yeah. Never know. Because uh, they were part of almost the same batch of, of pilots. So where where uh, uh, yeah since uh, since uh, Finn uh, he he would deliver aircraft and but I guess he would f- deliver the most most of the heavy stuff like bombers and uh, yeah he did big big aircraft yeah, yeah. He, he 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 delivered the uh, uh, the big aircraft from from uh, Americas to to Britain yes okay are we uh, we have to um, we've been talking for an hour and we have to uh, round things up a little bit yeah do uh, we have any final words final words on this uh, we we uh, we can do this again with some other pilots um, because uh, I've I've st- I about to say studied them but I, they're, they're they are different in in a way and they're different because I've read it or I, it's different because I I see it or just feel it um, but I hope that we have uh, managed to um, to um, explain how Finn uh, the person was and what he was like, even though I never met him, but I've met his family and you can tell by that and you can tell by his writing and you can tell by people talking about him and that we've characterized him uh, the right way. And I'm, I don't think we're that far off. And for our uh, English re- readers uh, or listeners, where can you find uh, your bu- your book uh, or information oh, that, about oh, very good, Finn. very good point. And yes, because this is uh, well, 2022. That's the 10 year anniversary of Viking Spitfire, because that it came out during the summer and or the fall of, of 2012. So it's still online. It's still on Amazon and it's on uh, book depository and and stuff like that. Um, so you, you can you can get it and some you can get it quite cheap if you're lucky as well. So um, do grab that because you know they're for English speakers, English listeners. It's all in there as well. Viking Spitfire. I like. I still like that title. Yeah, it was that was that was the publisher's idea, and I didn't say no. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I think I think um, for my cl- closing words would be that um, um, I think Finn is a uh, is a great example of the time. On the period of of, uh, of of our country and and the and the youth of that time, since yeah, yeah as you said, there are extreme uh, differences between the individuals. They're individuals. They have different ways, but sort of the the core the core of being uh, wanting to make a difference, taking the risks, and uh, fighting uh, in the war that not many people know of yeah. i think he is like he can represent all of them he's he you know you always speak about rolf arne berg as some sort of poster boy uh, but you know finn tushager he he's just as a good poster boy or an example of of uh, someone from that era and from and someone who uh, grew up and uh, became a captain for uh, sis and he flew uh, passenger jets for several years and he retired in 76 he was a family man uh, he was a kind man he was just unlucky in that term of being thrown into a war where uh, he, he was in that he basically had to kill someone I don't think he ever uh, did that because he <laughs> never managed to shoot that uh, focal wolf down uh, but he's just he's just a Norwegian boy of that time thrown into something that he wasn't in control of. Mm. No, I think those are great final words. And uh, what will be the next podcast? And will it will it be life? Was well, that you plugged in earlier today? Oh yeah, maybe we should just, should just to get that out of the way too. 
uh, <laughs> just talk about test test piloting, you know, Spitfires and uh, and all of that stuff. Uh, so maybe he will be next, uh, just because I that's we should we should do one on Rolf Arneberg as well. Um, but I haven't really you know gone so deep into him, but I'm sure we can fill like 60 minutes of him too. Uh, I'm I'm quite sure about that. So uh, we, we, let's do more of this. This is the essence of what we're doing, uh, because without these guys, there wouldn't really be any Spitfires flying around. Uh, so this is this is the essence of what we're doing. We're just you know giving uh, credit or or whatever to to these guys who who flew these uh, machines and risked their lives doing it and suffered terribly during and after the war because of it. Our our small way of remembering them. Exactly. Right, Knut. Let's uh, wish everyone a happy new year and let's hope for another podcast quite soon. Yes, everyone, have a happy new year and we will see you in the next one. We will. And goodbye.